excited uh, to welcome Steve Frick as the pediatric visiting professor this year. Uh, he is the uh, chief of pediatric orthopedics at Lucille Packard, which is the Stanford Associated Children's Hospital, where he's a professor and the vice chair for education. He did his residency at um, Carolina's Medical Center and then uh, fellowship at Brady Children's in San Diego before going back to uh, Carolinas. And he was the program director there for a number of years. Um, then went to Nemours Children's Hospital in Orlando where he was the Chief of Pediatric Orthopedics uh, before heading up to Stanford about uh, seven or eight years ago. Um, he has served uh, all of our organizations in high-level roles. He's the director of the ABOS right now. He's past president of POSNA, uh, reviews for a lot of journals, published a lot, and uh, knows just about everybody uh, in pediatric orthopedics. Uh, around the country and the world. And we're uh, super excited to have him. He's going to talk this hour about super toddlers. And next hour, you're welcome to stay for DDH in the uh, 6 to 24 month age population. So, welcome. Hey, thank you, Alan. You guys hear me back there okay? Good. All right. Well, this will be interactive. Um, I have three uh, people who are voluntold to uh, sit in the front row and they have a microphone. Uh, it won't be your typical uh, lecture. Um, it's great to be uh, here in Utah. I have some Utah connections. I don't know if this is going to work. Let's use this. Or maybe that won't work. Let's see. There we go. We're going forward now. All right. So, uh, Kevin Jay and I were fellows together. Um, having a run residency program, I think one of the things that program directors think a lot about is what do we want our residents to know and what do we want them to be able to do when they leave residency. And uh, the two people I've worked most closely with in my career who graduated from this residency program can do an awful lot and know an awful lot and both of them are better surgeons and doctors than I am. So Kevin and I um, work together now at Stanford and he's gotten me, I have way more bikes now than I had before I met Kevin Shea. So he loves to be on a bike. Um, and I just put this for the faculty here because they've never seen Kevin Shane in a tuxedo before. So it's the only time in my life I've ever seen him in one either, so I had to get a picture. So, but Kevin has been a fantastic colleague and lifelong friend. And then Jenny Casey, when I was in Charlotte, we worked together for over a decade, a fantastic person. And uh, this is Jenny uh, a few weeks ago moderating at the awards paper session um, at Pozna. Um, just a wonderful surgeon mom, doctor, human, friend. So I've been doing this for about 25 years. I'll try to share some of that experience with you. Um, I've taken residents through countless super common humerus fractures. Uh, these are some of them. Sahi was a, this was his very last case in residency. He thought he was free and clear on his very last night on call. We got a bad super condyler and I just stood there and watched him do it. He did a perfect job. And so hopefully we'll help you all do a perfect job when it comes in when you're on call. So Sahi, though, I want you to, I try to be a learner, not a knower. I know a little bit about superconductive humerus fractures. I'd like to know more. I can always learn more, but I have the way that I like to do it, which, of course, is the right way, but we'll talk about that. Um, but it's 20 steps that I give the residents. So Sahi went did a hand fellowship. He was fortunate in his hand fellowship in Charlotte that at the, this, he didn't know it was going to happen, but Peter Waters, who's probably the preeminent upper extremity pediatric surgeon in the world, Moved to Charlotte, and so Sahi got to work with him, and he's on call with him, and so he decides, like, Dr. Waters, I'm going to show you how to do a supercondylar humerus fracture. You're going to do it the Frick way, the 20 steps he has on his phone. I was like, Sahi, no. <laughs> it's just not. Peter Waters knows a lot more about this than I do. But what I want to know is I want to know what a residents from the University of Utah know about supercondylars, and we're trying to get you on this. It used to be milestones. Now we've changed this, but from, you know, pick your way you want to assess, but level one to level four, which we call competent, Five maybe expert. This is in the old days of the data we used to do. I worked on this a decade ago. Now it's changed, but so we'll get started. So Olivia, this is I'm a PGY2. I'm in Charlotte. This comes in from the mountains of North Carolina. I get a call. As that sounds like you all, your residents here get a call. Um, it's interesting. We I switch that. Attendings take that call uh, at Stanford just because. I'm not sure that all the residents will tell the people the right thing, but uh, that's a whole different story. But what would you tell, uh, you get a call from the mountains of Utah, two and a half hours away, some kid's got a pulse of supercondylar humerus fracture, what would you tell the ER doctor, what questions would you ask? Yeah. Okay, 
Um, so this is a pulse supercondylar with a white hand. Yeah. Um, they definitely need to be transferred in for an emergent production. Yeah. And what does that tell you? White hand versus pink hand, or perfused um, hands, probably so a better term. To me, instead of having pulses, it means it's a more likely to If the hand is white, different story, usually a vascular injury. So what would you tell them? You got to transfer them in. Like, what are you going to tell them about the patient? You got to give them any instructions? Um, sure, I say, you know, you can temporize with um, just like close to your So first aid, immobilize broken bones, yes. Mm -hmm. What position? Um, most of the time, just kind of where the patient is comfortable. Yeah. Um, I would do it not. So, so I, I neglected to do that, and they sent the kid to me like this. Okay? So you're a doctor. It's pulseless. I got to do a reduction because that's what they get, you know, fractures with no pulse get reduced. So they do a reduction. So they came to me like this, blended like this. So Matt, they showed up and now you're, you're we're here to catch this injured child and you're in the ER and they show up and this is the x-ray you get. What are you going to do? Yeah, I'm going to take of that. How will displant? First thing you do, like straighten the elbow out, right? What do you think happened when I did that? Pulse came back, hands not light anymore. Like, I'm breathing better, but still, it's like, I didn't tell them. This kid was in this for, I don't know, a long time. I was worried that I could cause ischemia. So tell the ER, they don't tell orthopedics. Tell them exactly what you want them to do. Put them in a splint, how much pain medicine, bring the x-ray, all those studies. But especially for this, don't let them flex the elbow, okay? So that leads to this question. So Matt, I'll give you a chance. Two reasons. Why do we pin supercondylar tumor fractures? So um, I think the literature suggests that better reduction Less, Less malunion. Okay, I like that answer. Don't like that answer. The range of motion would be fine if we pinned it or didn't pin it. Probably their kids, and so it's not a it's not a joint fracture. Usually, we don't usually have trouble with elbow range of motion. But so now you got one. You're good. Fifty fifty. So what do you think, Matt? Number two. Joel. Joel told me to just say, if I had a question, just ask, ask Matt. <laughs> so, but uh, I think historically, reason number two. Historically, they were treated close in casting and um, mm -hmm. sort of in that position that the split was in to try and get better alignment. Okay. This led to. Uh, so this is the history. You're right. You're on the right track. And so two reasons we pin them: one, avoid malunion; two, what are we trying to avoid? Catastrophic complications. Catastrophic, exactly. Mercer Rang said, avoid catastrophe. Like, you know, there's lots of things that could go wrong in a supraglial humerus fracture that I can fix. This is not one of them, right? So avoid catastrophe. So what is this? What is this, Olivia? Um, Why does this happen? What's? Uh, Volkman's ischemic contraction. Yes, what is it? How does it happen? What's the pathophysiology of Volkman's ischemic contraction? Um, so it's sort of, um, the way I thought about it is sort of compartment syndrome-ish. Yeah. Um, Most people say it's compartment syndrome. Yeah, it's basically compartment syndrome. So why do you call it ischemia? Um, what caused it? It's like necrosis. Did, I thought the kid broke his arm, not his forearm. Why is the forearm swollen? Um, because of the vascular injury. Yes, it's a vascular problem. It's not a swelling problem. Right. The ischemia is the main issue. Then leads to swelling, and compartment syndrome be part of it. This is not compartment syndrome like a car ran over your tibia. This is compartment syndrome because your brachial artery is getting pinched. Or disrupted, right? So who knows who William who, who Blount is? Do you know who's Blount? Blount's disease. Blount's disease. A named Blount's disease. Blount Staples. So you wrote a book on. And we're going to talk more about books, but because I like to pick on this generation. But do you guys read books? <laughs> There'll be more of that coming later. So anyway, this is a, this is a great book, uh, Children's Fractures, and he, this picture on the left is from. The, that book. So Matt, what what is that picture depicting? What is what is he trying to? What message is he saying? What is he giving you? Hey, can you guys hear that back there? Well, you should look at the actual clinical status of. The look at the patient. We love to look at the X-rays. How many X-rays? Uh, how many photographs of patients did you see this morning in the conference? Did you see an Adams Ford bend test or a shoulder? Or any, we like to look at the x rays. We love, I love x rays. This is very gratifying. Right? So don't just look at your x ray. What's happening to this poor little girl who's in the position that I showed you? Because that's how you reduce it. And that, they used to get casted like this go home with your elbow flexed, 
So what's happening to her? She's developing compartment syndrome. Compartment syndrome. The P's of compartment syndrome. She's got three. How many P's are there? Six. Yeah, maybe more than that even. I have no idea what poikilothermia is, but that's a P too. <laughs> so anyway, uh, what are better for kids? P's? Is that the right letter? Matt number two shaking his head no. Matt number one? No. No, what are the, what's better? Three A's. And what are the three A's? You know them, I know it's in there. She's whispering. Get help from a friend. Hand it over. Uh, what are the three A's? Uh, increased analgesia requirement. Increased need for analgesia. That's one A. Um, agitation. Agitation. Bouncing off the walls. One says still. That's two. Anxiety. Anxiety. So who, who's who got the pager tonight covering the hospital? You. What's your name? Serena. Serena. Oh, yeah. I didn't recognize you yet. I'm not hiking in here. So, Serena, you're going to get a call. It's 2 in the morning. The nurse calls you and says, you know, Dr. Carroll pinned this kid's elbow this afternoon, and she, the kid just won't calm down, and I need a little dose of Ativan at point 0.1. You know, I think it's 0.01 per kilogram or something. Can I have that? What, what's your answer? Uh, yes, you can have it. No. You know, how much does the kid weigh? What's the answer? I would ask more about other symptoms. Or she might say, you know, this isn't holding her. You know, she needs, you only gave 0.01 per kilo morphine. I need 0.02. Go see the patient. That's the answer. The answer is, I'll be right there. You know, that's the answer. So, all right. So, goal number one, the reason we pin them, like, and so again, like you learn, fused to the stable invertebra, kind of like a rule when you're standing up here and everybody's staring at you to stay out of trouble. Any fracture, they say, well, why'd you operate on this? To obtain and maintain an acceptable reduction until the fracture heals. So that's number one, because we know that if you treat type 3 supracondylar humerus fractures in a cast, high incidence of cubitus varus, right? Three components of cubitus varus, Joel. Quick. Sagittal plane, coronal plane. One of them is varus, so I'll give you that one. In the sagittal plane, is cubitus varus usually extended or flexed? Extended. Extended. Internally rotated or externally rotated? Or, I'm sorry, not, I'm, in, I'm in Utah. My bad. Yeah. Outward rotation or <laughs> inward rotation? Inward rotation. Inward rotation, because they're usually in a sling like this, so it's usually inwardly rotated, it's usually extended, and it's embarrassed. So you gotta think of three planes. All right, Olivia, this is an actual note without any HIPAA stuff from a kid in, oh, I, I should have mentioned to you that I don't have any financial disclaimers for this talk other than I get paid to operate on children with elbow fractures. And I have no financial interest in monkey bars, although I probably should, because it's helped my career a lot. So, fell off the monkey bars. And this is the note. You, this is a good note or a bad note? Do you like it? Is there anything in there you don't like? I think it's a pretty good note. It's pretty detailed. I, I'm, what I'm getting to is I don't want to see NVI. That helps me not at all. It's dangerous. So every nerve needs to be described. I need to know if they have a pulse or not. If they don't have a pulse, I want to know if they have a Doppler signal. So really pretty good. So I think it's a pretty good note. Refuses to fire because of pain. That, I don't like that one. Most children, can you can get them to demonstrate motor ability. Um, but otherwise, it's a pretty good note. And I think it's really important. Like this note, a good detailed pre-op note will drive decision making after surgery if something's happening. So it's really important that you write a good note and you detail each nerve and you tell us about the perfusion and about um, the radial pulse. All right, so here is the x-ray. So what do you think, Matt? Um, that we have, what that was described is a perfused pulseless, perhaps an ulnar nerve issue. Um, so no pulse. I can't remember what the note said. It was, it's 10 to 30, 11 o'clock at night. We have this x-ray. What are we gonna do? Pulses, yeah, no pulse. Emergent lady of the OR. What's emergent here? Most ORs are A, B, C, D. Emergent is life threatening, limb threatening, less than an hour. We're going to be in the OR doing this. Do you need to do that? Yeah. Probably not. But I would say I'm going to get the OR as soon as I can. But I, like, you don't have to like kick somebody out of an OR who's doing an elective case to get me in there. But I'm going in right after they finish. So within a, within a few hours, it would be a B in our system, not an A. Okay, so we're going to go soon. I think that's the point of this is that, and then what are you, you know, what are you going to ask for? What are you going to tell the OR you need? So I'd ask for, um, obviously, for the RSP, I'd ask for CRM, yep. 
uh, small power set. Yep, yeah, need a drill, K wires. Mm -hmm. What else? Um, I'd ask for um, like a small ortho set. Um, basically, need to open. Yeah, be ready to open. That's basically the message. A handset, some small instruments in case you need it. Maybe don't open them, have them in the room. Yeah. Who does, if the artery is ripped in half, who's going to fix it here? Vascular. Vascular does it here. Who's your vascular surgeon? Do you know? Actually, don't know. So if you're the peds attending, you should know them. You don't want to meet them at 2 in the morning when you've never talked to them about this scenario before because they might tell you some crazy stuff. Like, didn't you get an art arteriogram? Should we get an arteriogram before we go to the orb? No, 100% no, zero, right? We know where the injury is. With some caveat, if they got rolled over and they have a clavicle fracture, like potential double crush, then you might do it. But garden variety, pulseless, no. What percentage of zip counters are pulseless? Um, it depends on what you read. It always depends on what you read. Yeah. So. Good, good disclaimer to let your brain work and figure out what the answer is. <laughs> yeah, ten, around 10%. Like if you look across the whole thing, maybe even higher. So if not uncommon is the point. So if you're going to take level one trauma call for a peds hospital, get to know your vascular team. In our institution, the hand surgeons would come in and fix it. Because our vascular surgeons don't want to operate on three, four, five-year-olds. So we call the hand surgeons, which is much better for us because they know bones and they won't tell us things that we go, wow, that doesn't sound right. So we're going to go. All right. So um, no, I'll give away one answer. Olivia, back uh, to you. What is this called? Break gallus line. What are the three components? Um, bruising. Bruising. You see that? Yes. Number one. There's generally like some puckering. Chin puckering. Number two. Um, uh, swelling. Fill the bone. You can just put your, the bone is subcutaneous. Like you just touch it. You're like, oh my gosh, there's the humerus that almost came out. So a palpable subcutaneous bone fragment. So what is this picture in the middle? This is a different kid, but what is that demonstrating to you? Like I walk in the room. They're holding their hand like this. They're, this is the resting posture of the kid's hand. What does that tell them? Because most, most of the time, my hand would be like this. Uh, so um, they're not firing AIN. AIN palsy. So I can tell from across the room. The PGY1 thinks I'm clairvoyant. That kid has an AIN palsy. No, it's just they lost their resting cascade. So what's, how do you test for the AIN palsy? Um, that's their thumb. IP, IP the thumb. And what else? Um, FDP to the index. What's the sensory distribution? Um, for AIN, mm -hmm. um, I generally test the. Uh, uh, He's shaking his head. He wants to help you. <laughs> no sensory. There is none. It's pure motor nerve. Okay, trick question. Sorry. So, but it's but there's no motor. I mean, it, it's all motor. But we want to know if there's sensation. So, is it, since Joel knew the answer, so Joel, tell me why is it important to know if this is an AIN palsy or a median nerve palsy? So it's a complete median nerve palsy, yeah. particularly in conjunction with. A pulseless extremity, yeah. the rate of actual injury that needs vascular exploration. Yeah, so much higher incidence of real brachial artery injury that might need an intervention. That's not the most important reason, though. <coughs> no, Joel's got his eyes up. Fellows, you want to help him? Why? What's the difference between it? Well, first of all, I'll ask you in Utah, if you don't have a brachial sign and you don't have a pulse and only the AIN is out, will you wait until the next morning? You will, right? I don't. Everybody agree with that? All the attendings, everybody waits till with it just an AIN palsy? What did they find in LA when they just did a study and they compared resident diagnosis of AIN palsy to attending diagnosis of AIN palsy? What did they find out? That often it was the median nerve was all out and it wasn't just an AIN palsy. So I don't wait, but that's a whole other story. So but why do we want to know? Why is it important? Do you know? Do you guys know? Amanda, Nancy? Are you going for like a missed compartment syndrome? Yeah, well, silent. You can miss a compartment syndrome. If you can't feel your form, like we're going for the P's do matter, pain, those, you know, that analgesia need is because it hurts. You can't feel your form, you're at higher risk for swelling, compartment syndrome, bad things to happen that I don't get the normal signals that tell me, oh, something bad is happening. Okay, pain is your friend. Despite the fact that someone tried to make it a fifth vital sign. All right, so how am I going to tell? AIN versus median nerve palsy. FDS. Yes. Awesome. I showed it to you already. I know you're, you're smart, but you probably did it already. So FDS. So the FDS is innervated. So if you just want to do a motor test, because I think sensory tests are difficult in a screaming five-year-old who's scared of you. So you can do this pretty easily, though. And just don't make a fist, hold their fingers out, and you can test FDS function. So that's good. So if that doesn't work, then I'm, I'm more worried, and I'm going to change my post-op immobilization so I can feel the forearm to see if they're swelling, because the kids are not going to be able to tell me if they... Gets one for one. All 
All right. So what's the role of the Doppler? Do you guys use the Doppler here much? Not pretty much. Not pretty up. Okay, so we'll talk about that in a little bit. So I like using the Doppler. I'm not sure that I can trust my pulse palpation technique all the time. All right, we talked about this a little bit. Um, I think most of us do it supine. Some of us do us prone. Like, I really would not do it prone if you have a brachialis sign. Like, prone is okay for straightforward ones that have a good pulse, everything's working. And we decided we're going to go in the middle of the night. So I'm in the OR, it's two in the morning, we're going to fix this elbow. So Matt, what are the steps? Kids asleep, anesthesia says go. What are you going to do? Um, so I'm going to take um, first just initial AP, lateral x ray, mm -hmm. um, the um, injured limb. If you, if it's a. So now it's time, we're going to reduce it. Are you going to reduce it before you prep, or are you going to prep and then reduce it? I've always prepped. Okay, so type twos, straight four, type threes, I might do the reduction, paint the elbow. This one I'm doing a full prep and drape, I might have to open it, might have to look at the artery. So full prep and drape, and then we're gonna reduce it. So what are the steps to reduction? That's really the purpose of this question. Oh, I gave you a little hint, sorry. So we did the breakout sign, those are the things. This is what I was getting at, okay? Do you know this article? Um, I haven't read this article, but I know the... The author of the article. So you should read this article. What did it show, Joel? If you don't do a milking maneuver, how successful are you at, at close reduction? Less than if you do. Yeah, exactly. Less than if you do. Like 17% compared to 80-something, I don't know. Something like that. But low. Like, so the purpose of the milking maneuver is to get the fragment that's gone through the brachialis is now sitting under the skin that you can feel to go back under the brachialis, and now we can do our typical reduction maneuver. And I like, some people do it different ways, but I like this picture. So go above the fracture, squeeze with your fingers, thumb and fingers so you can feel the humerus and then squeeze hard and lift the brachialis off the humerus starting above the fracture and then milk your way down and you'll feel it. It's very gratifying. Pop goes back and yeah, now we can do it. The dumper goes away, you can't feel the bone anymore. So, all right, so then what are we gonna do? What are the steps to getting a, a bad supercolon reduced mat? Yeah, so, um, Mercer Rang, classic step. Is it in a bone? Did you think it <coughs> So Mercer Rang's Children's Fractures. Raise your hand. Have you read that book? Oh, you haven't read that book? All right. There's knowledge in books. Even Elon Musk agrees. Like they said, how do you send a rocket to outer space? He's like, I read books. So, read some books. So, once you milk the fracture out of the... Um... Milk the fracture out? Yeah, no, we're there. We're ready to go. We need, I need to know the steps. Traction first. I like that. You're on the right track. Exactly. Traction, correct varus valgus. What else is in the AP plane? There's tilt and there's this. Translation. So correct medial lateral translation, correct varus valgus. Great. Then what, Olivia? What's next? Yeah, flex. Flex the elbow, okay? What, where do you put your hands when you flex the elbow? Um, generally kind of have a thumb down by the electron. Thumb on the electron. Excellent. Flexion, like this. So this is from the book. So traction, correct varus valgus. If it's often a little inwardly rotated, so outwardly rotate it, you know, if you want. Put your thumb on the electron, push forward as you're flexing. Why do we pronate it? You know, stability. Supposedly improved stability related something might relate to which way it went beforehand and tightening up the periosteum. I don't think it makes any difference personally. But what I do is I pronate it, say, does it look good? If it doesn't, I can take it out and I go back neutral. Does that better? And I go back, I will supinate it. So um, but that's the idea. And probably most of the stability comes from the triceps and maybe intact posterior periosteum, medial lateral, probably doesn't matter. So do these steps. If you do the steps every time, and don't skip one, and don't try to go too fast. Um, Surgery is a symphony, slow parts and fast parts. This is a slow part. This is what matters. Get the reduction, right? So get a reduction. <clears throat> What's a good reduction, Joel? So, well, I'll ask you this question first. How many closed, neurologically intact, normal pulses Closed supercondylar humerus fractures get opened in Utah every year. This hospital. How many? Less than 10%, less than 1%, half of them? Less than less than one to two percent. I yeah, low, low, right? Low. So what does the literature say? Why don't you guys open more fractures? Like the literature is like eight to ten percent. Because you don't need to. I mean, I think as long as you get a reasonable alignment on the lateral and reasonable Reasonable, what's reasonable? So now you're getting to the question. The reason is, and if you read all the literature, 
Dr. Salzman is an editor. I just drives me crazy. There, no one ever makes the authors define what's an acceptable reduction. It's not in any paper that I can find or could find until we wrote our paper in 2013. So what's an acceptable reduction for us is thou shalt not bear. It's an orthopedic commandment, right? Everybody said that. Thou shalt not bear. So no, no bears. Varus doesn't remodel the distal humerus. And then how about the sagittal plane? What's reasonable? You should at least Give me a rule that we can all agree on. Yes, it touch the capitella. So if you do those two things, there's almost no pediatric superhomogeneous fracture that I won't look at and say, that's good enough. You know? And uh, I learned that from Jim Kellum. Good enough is good enough. And the enemy of good is better, right? So, um, so for, but they don't define that in the literature. And then they'll talk about, they'll say things like it required open reduction. Like, no surgery. There, you don't, there's no surgery in orthopedics unless it's required. Like, we're just straightening crooked bones. You, you decided to, to reduce it or to open it, and, but you need to define the criteria, right? So, no varus, anterior humeral line touches the capitellum. Maybe in a young kid, I might not even say that it touches the capitellum. Why is that? Marty Hurt, St. Chris, what did he write about? In young kids. Yet, so. Yeah, it's in the back more. So it's more posterior. The ossification center is more posterior than the actual capitellum in a kid less than, say, three or four years old. So if it's a really little kid, I might not even take that, you know? And Jim Kellum at our place has said that the sagittal plane actually will remodel in the distal humerus. And you can see improvement even if you leave it a little extended. So you not have to know what the criteria are. If you're going to decide, do I need to open it or not? Well, you got to know, like, what's acceptable. Because mm -hmm. remember, going back to the beginning, our goal is what? Obtain maintain acceptable reduction until the fracture heals, right? All right, so how are we going to pin it? What size pins are you going to use, Matt? So if it's a child... What's the rules? Um, I, believe if the, I believe if the child is um, less than 8, you'll use a 1.6 millimeter, and then greater than that, 2 millimeters. I like that rule. It's made up. I think I might have made it up but, and put it somewhere, but it's, that's, that's a made-up rule. But that's my rule. So 1.6, less than 8, or 20 kilos... More than eight, I go to a two millimeter pen. I usually don't go bigger than that. Where are you going to start? Which what pen are you put in first? Uh, so two lateral. Mm -hmm. um, and the target is to have um, one in each column. Excellent. Yep, you guys know it. So this is David Skaggs' paper that changed this. Why did we switch, Olivia? Why did we go from cross pens to lateral instruments? I believe because there's no difference um, in that study on their ability to hold a reduction, but there was a higher incidence of ulnar nerve palsy. Yeah. We're trying to avoid iatrogenic nerve injury, right? I cross pin. I used to think orthopedically, which is type twos get two pins and type threes get three pins, and very concrete thinking. And I put two lateral pins in, and then I put a medial pin in. That was my construct for a long time. Um, and I never personally had an iatrogenic nerve palsy, but I convinced myself, and I think it's true, that if I don't put a pin near the meat ulnar nerve, then I have a you know a lower chance of injury. So I went to lateral entry pens too. All right, how about these lateral pens? What do you think about these, Joel? This is from Jay Posna, who's read Jay Posna, Ken Noonan as the editor. So it's a good free, you can just go on the Posna website, it's a great pediatric journal, comes out once a month. I mean, these pins all don't really cross the fracture, so. Yeah, so some of them don't cross the fracture, all of them are in the lateral, they cross the fracture in the lateral third. So like Matt was saying, what I like to do is draw lines. There's a medial third, middle third, lateral third. I want one pen across the fracture, the lateral third, one to pen. So we graded constructs in our paper and gave that an A. If you were in the middle and either lateral or middle and medial, we give that a B. This would get a C. It's all in one column. It can rotate off, and that's what happened. So make sure you have a good pen construct. So here's the pens for the case that I just showed you. What do you think? What would you give me, Matt? Did you get to grade me? It's not an A. Uh, it's a B. It's a B. Yeah, there's kind of two in the middle, one in the lateral. I didn't really get over. I try to get the. I try to aim for. I, I start this medial pin first next to the electron, and I try to aim just above the fracture, so I try to cross. Sometimes it's a little harder. So I give myself a B, but good enough. So and how do we tell that? So I think you should get five C arm views: AP, lateral, uh, inward rotation, out rotation, oblique. You know. And then I often get a Jones view with the elbow flexed and measure something that we're going to talk about. How do you know that I'm not embarrassed? What do we measure? Balance angle. angle. What's a normal balance angle? 70 to 75. Probably even wider. It's probably 64 to 80. 
Normal is probably 72 to 74. Wide variance, if, you're, if you can remember in the heat of the battle, while well, anesthesia is putting the kid to sleep, it's good to go look at the other elbow, straighten their arm out, see what their actual carrying angle is. My son has slight cubitus varus. Probably has some skeletal dysplasia I'm not having diagnosed yet. He's 32 years old. so. Um, but some kids have a little bit of varus. So uh, how about on the lateral view, how are these spins? Good? How do you know? How do you know, Joel, if it's a good pin? I mean, it should be bicortical. Should be, how do you know that? So it should Does the x-ray tell you? Well, the field tells you. Feel tells you. So the first thing you learn when I, I'm telling you, I'm listening, I can hear the pitch change. There's a feel operation. So when it first was described, it was blind pinning. They didn't have C-arms. You just had to feel it. There's good bone. Oh, it's easy now. Hopefully there's good bone again. I've had two residents pin my patient, one to the floor machine and one to the OR table. And they didn't feel enough, and I wasn't paying enough attention. I learned to like, watch the travel of the K-wire. So you got to know how far it's going in. I went to get a lateral, and I was like, oh, the C-arm's moving. So, so um, but I think they're good. So you have to feel them. So you know, I can tell by the pitch thing, like, that's a good pin. I don't even have to get an x-ray. So it's a feel operation, and because you can figure yourself out with the, if you don't, it looks like, oh, that's a bone on both sides. You got to feel it, right? So how do you take care of pins here? What's your favorite pen skin so management technique? Yeah. Most attendees here will do zero form in one fashion or another, okay. right at the skin, and then sterile felt, and then okay. sterile cast padding, and then most people are doing uh, sort of cast padding splint for a week and then exchanging for a cast. Okay. Probably works just fine. You should study it. So we looked at Nemours across four hospitals when I was there, about 500 elbows. And the pens that had uh, skin problems were either zero form wrapped around the pen at the bottom, so it then becomes a hard, bloody little ball that then pushes on the skin and they get skin necrosis, or these Jurgens balls that usually like foot doctors or hand doctors use and they put them on and it has a little set screw and maybe the guy using them would push it down to the skin and tighten it and if it's swollen, if it got swollen, then it would get skin. So I just put a sterile felt across it. And, but it doesn't matter as long as you manage the skin pen interface. Um, what do you think the most common complication now in modern series is of supercranial hemorrhage fractures? Pensite inflammation infection, right? Um, knock on wood. So I, I've never given a child an antibiotic for a pensite complication in the elbow. So this, I, for me, this worked. I, you know, I learned this in fellowship, and I've been doing it the same way. I'll get one next week now. <laughs> so how do you test stability after you pin it, Olivia? So we wrote this little cadaveric paper, and I was, thought I was clever because Chris Yotes was my partner. So I called it the Intraoperative Bone Stability Test. And it spelled his last name. hasn't really caught on. But. Jen, take it through a range of motion and stress it under floral. Stress it under floral. What's the most important thing to stress? Which way? Jen, Bauer, Vanderbilt. Flexion extension. I do flexion extension too, though, but most important, what do you think it is? Which way? I was going to say internal, but inward. Yeah, I was trying to figure yeah. out which one. Yeah, exactly. Inward. So you want an inward rotation. Why is that? Why is it? What x ray will your x ray tech get in clinic when the kid comes back? They're going to get um, that one. They're not going to get they, uh, We get this one in the OR. They're going to get this one in the clinic or this one. So they're, you're going to see, and so if you don't know what an inward rotation view looks like, you can save that C-arm shot, you're going to think your fracture's falling apart, when in reality, that's just what you left the OR with. So inward rotation is most important. So for me, let's see. And then you can see this is a stable one where I haven't, you know, I'm not, I don't even have a gown on, so I used to just and I've toweled off, but I just did a reduction, painted the elbow, put some towels and sheets down, and then I pinned it. But this is me afterwards. So I go all the way outward to inward, come back, flexion extension. If the two fragments move together, I don't see any independent movement or instability, then I don't put another pin in. All right, what if it was, what if it did move? And I've got three lateral pins in, what should I do? Put a fourth lateral pin in? I would say. Bare lateral, lateral pin in? Be very critical of your lateral yeah. pins. Yeah. One is, do I have good pins? Did they feel good? Did they look good on the X-ray? But say they look like the one I just showed you. Seems acceptable. Um, I think at that point you could consider a medial pin. Medial pin, yeah. So how are we going to put a medial pin in safely? Yeah. 
Would you amend the open? Um, because I think you might have to make a decision. I usually don't make a decision, but you could. Okay. I, I just feel like what trick? What, what should you do to put a safe medial pin in? So you should there you go. The like everybody else, people, people are doing. All these people are going straighten the elbow out. So yeah, straighten the elbow out. So uh, here's a supercondyler that is going to need a medial pin. You can tell by this unusual fracture pattern, right? Um, but the key is stabilize the lateral side. And that's how I used to do them with two. My three originally were two pins laterally. Because then I can straighten the elbow out some. Why is it important to straighten the elbow out some, Olivia? In this age group. So what, what age group patients get supercondyling hemorrhage fractures? Five seven, five seven, perfect. And why is that? So it's good to know the answers. It's better to know why, right? Why? Uh, it's uh, potentially mechanism, and then also the why, Joel? Their bone is weaker there. Though. Bone's weaker there. My bone's still weaker there. If I fall down, put my hand out, I'm I'm, I'm more likely to break my distal radius or my forearm. And does the bone get a lot stronger between, say, 8 and 12? Because if an 8 to 12-year-old falls down on an outstretched hand, they're much more likely to get a forearm fracture than a supercondyler. So why is that? Matt knows. Uh, um, hyperlaxity. Hyperlaxity or hyperextension. So if you take a kid that has, and if you end up having the 11-year-old that does have a supercondyler, I promise you, if you examine the other side, it hyperextends. So they land, elbow hyperextends, electronon crashes into the thin part of the distal humerus, snap, and get... So, but what else do they have in that same age group? Exactly. So, if you are smart enough and you remember, which I usually forget, go to the other side, check in the carrying angle. Hey, yeah, they hyperextend. I'll start to put my thumb there and flex it and see if I feel their ulnar nerve subluxate over the medial epicondyle. And I can't remember, it might have been high results, but there was a Boston study, and it was high. I mean, it's like 10, 12, 15%, I can't remember the exact number, but a lot of five to seven year olds, they're all nerve. So if you pin them like this, the ulnar nerve is sitting right where you want to put your pin. By doing this, you can let it go back. I just put my thumb on it. If I can really feel it, I just hold it, and then I tell the residents, tell me I'll put the pin. You know, if you can't, if you're not sure, it's totally fine to make a little incision. In this case, I made a big incision. Because I had to put two medial pins in, I wanted to make sure the nerve wasn't out of the way. There was an intraarticular piece, and so it gets a kind of a crazy construct. Um, but um, kids will heal and did fine. So, but the main point of this one is straight the elbow out. All right, let's talk about the Doppler and why we should use the Doppler. Okay, so this paper from Dallas really helped me figure out when to use the Doppler, and uh, in in their study, if they had a perfused pulses supercondylar, they do a closed reduction, you can see this middle column, 26 got a pulse back, 20 had a Doppler pulse, um, 4, nothing, and so their answer, no Doppler, explore. Okay, get a vascular so you look at the order. And I, and I do that now. I don't know if the here. What's here. What are the rules here? Anything? We've got our, our flow chart. I'll discuss it. Flow chart. Briefly, yeah, our, our flow chart is here if you want yeah. to see it. But basically, our uh, for pink pulseless or pink palpable pulse, we observe for 12 hours. Pink do Doppler, we observe for 24 hours. Yeah. And pink no Doppler, observe 48 hours, possible warning, possible basket console. Okay. But so if you're in the OR, you didn't tell me about the, if, does the Doppler change at all? Like if you have no Doppler, but the hand looks warm and is perfused, has good capillary refill. And you can even ask the anesthesia, they're experts at capillary refill. Like, come around, look at the sand. Do you think the sand looks okay? Does it look like the other side? Can you look under the drapes? Tell me, what, how, how are we doing? Because maybe the kid's hypotensive, maybe the other hand looks white. You know, so sometimes if I'm really struggling, there's an expert in perfusion at the head of the table that can help me. So I'll ask them to come help me. So what would you do? No, it, and they say, yeah, looks great. Has good capillary refill, just like the other side, but you don't have a Doppler at the wrist. You have no signal, what would you do? Watch it. So here, here, if it's good capillary refill, mm -hmm. no Doppler, yeah. watch for at least 48 hours, and yeah. then it's somewhat attending specific here. Yeah. Right. And I think that's probably okay, but you, you have to watch them very carefully, which we're going to talk about. But there was a paper, our paper from Charlotte was right next to this paper in JBS, and that's what we said. For a few, we could not find any Boltmans, we didn't have any growth disturbances, they did okay. And one of the, but only one of those 20 patients was what you, I just described, where they had no good Doppler flow at all at the wrist. It was quiet. And if, for me, if it's blowing like the wind, I don't like that. Monophasic Doppler. So I like it at some biophasic flow, and I'll open it. 
And uh, so I have a pretty a lower threshold, but I, I don't have data to say that really matters. And I think careful observation is the most important thing. All right, who's going in arc blasting? Raise your hand, resident. All right, who's John Charlie? Uh, one of the of our Excellent. Where's he from? England. Can't remember what city. Yeah. So if you ever get a chance, you should go to his center. Um, but he, he was knighted for his contributions, low friction arthroplasty. But this is my favorite book that he wrote. And uh, he's in, from central UK. And, uh, and who, who's read this book? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> from the UK. You have to read it. <laughs> So, but if you want to read it and you're interested in fractures, I have a PDF of it. It's not printed anymore, but I'm happy to send me an email. I'm happy to send it to you. So, um, <clears throat> this is from his book. So, this is, this is a kid's elbow. This is what happens when you bend the balloon, right? So, what's, what's in the front, Olivia, of the kid's elbow? What's going to get pinched by that? Okay, so, so there's a lot of things to think about. We've, we've fixed the fracture. Um, we've worried about a lot of things. But, so, now we're going to immobilize them, and we want to know how to do it safely. So I heard the, usually a splint here, and change a cast, you'll see what I do later. But mainly this is about what position should you put the elbow in? How do you determine how much flexion? Uh, like 90 degrees maximum flexion. Why is that? Um, so they don't kink the vessels. Yeah, and where did that come from? How do, how do I know if they get kinked or not? Are there any studies? Um, from the, from, we kind of talked about it earlier, like historically the close treatment. Yeah, sort of, what do you think, Matt? There are some studies on this. I can't remember who the mm -hmm. author is, but Bill Henriquez. Yeah, flexion greater than 90 formation decreases. Yeah, so he just this is a great, elegant, simple little. Just put a Doppler on the wrist after he finished pinning, and just checked, flex the elbow until the signal went away. And a lot of them, none of them, less than 90. And as soon as they got above 90, a good percentage of them, the the signal goes away at the radial artery. And pronation may make that worse too. Although I think that's just probably twisting and making it longer too. You know. So anyway, so we don't. Prone in accessibly, we usually leave it at neutral, but elbow flexion. So how do you decide? Should I put it at 89, 80, 75? What's your, how do you decide, Joel? I, we usually just go just shy of 90 degrees. Just shy, okay. So what I do, because every kid's swelling is different, and I, the study that you guys, you have enough elbows, you should do it, is like no one's ever quantified severe soft tissue swelling, which is also in the literature as a reason to open or a reason to observe. Like, what does that mean? Like, you look at, oh my gosh, it's terribly severe. It would be easy. Just take a tape measure, measure the opposite side at the level of the supercondylar, measure the injured side, you get a ratio, and now we could figure it out and quantify it. But so far, I haven't gotten cortices or any of the other groups. Like, could you just put a tape measure around the arm and check it? So, so because they're different. So some of them are increased like this at 70. And some of them it's going to take till 90. So for me, I just after I'm finished, I bend the elbow till I see a crease like in my jacket here, and then I just extend it five, 10 degrees, and I say that's where we're going to put it. So before I put the cast on, and I, before I wrap my sterile cast padding around it, I just flex it, uh, creases there, because that's what I'm thinking about, and I'll just put it five to 10 less than that. All right, this is how I do this. We put fiberglass on. Um, in the interest of time, I'll question you, but I'll just tell you that, do you know what the stretch relax technique is? You heard of that? So I learned that from John Davids. I was a fourth year resident. He told me this is how you should put casts on. And he said, then you only have to split it on one side. And I'm like, really? How do you know that? Because I, the why, he didn't know the why. So um, I was at a shrine, which was amazing, with a guy named Ed Skews. Ed was the head of prosthetics at the Greenville Shrine. I went down there. I said, can you build me a typical 10-year-old leg? And I'm going to do some pressure studies. So he built me a model of a 10-year-old leg. And then I had this pressure sensor that I would put under, on the leg. And I would put a bag of saline inside the calf compartment. And then I would just blow it up like it was swelling. And I'd put different casts on, plaster, fiberglass without stretch relax, fiberglass with. And that was my first KBGS publication when I was a fourth year resident um, from a simple idea in clinic where, or in the OR where I questioned the attending and said, why, why? Why do you do that? So, and we did actually show that if you put plaster on, if you want to get the, and you simulate swelling, if you want the pressure to go down to the level that was there before you put the cast on in the leg, quote, compartment, uh, that you had to cut plaster on both sides and spread it. For fiberglass, you just had to cut it on one side and spread it if you use stretch relax. If you put it on, stretching it as you go, it's dangerous. Um, the first uh, Journal of Orthopedic Trauma had an article on using fiberglass for fractures, and they said, don't do it, it's dangerous. 
Never put fiberglass on an acute fracture. But that's because they put the fiberglass on the wrong way. So like everything else, you have to do it the right way for it to work, right? So this is how I do it. I spread it, put these little spacers in. Let's talk about this. So we got this perfused, pulseless. We, you know, I got a Doppler signal, but I don't palpate a pulse. So I'm going to, I'm not going to open it. Um, but what is careful observation? What do you think? What does that mean? Be careful. Don't let something catastrophic happen. I mean, I'd say start, starting off uh, post-operatively, starting with Q1 to Q2 hour. Uh, so checks. frequent checks, yes. What are, they, what are you going to tell them to check? Doppler signals. And Doppler signals. So order Doppler to the bedside. You can see how I do it. I cut a thing out where the radial artery is. I put a Sharpie dot on the radial artery where I have to hear it so the nurse doesn't have to search for it. So Q1 hour, what else? And this is in Brian Scannell's paper. Like our discussion defines, like we said, you should carefully observe them. So that we said, what is that? Pulse ox on that. Pulse ox. I put a pulse ox on the finger. How much is enough? It might be higher in the mountains. I don't know. Maybe you don't need the same percentage as you do in the low ox. Maybe any more. I don't know. I feel like we, most of our patients live in the low 90s here. Yeah. So I say less than 92. I want, an, I want an alarm to go off at the nursing station when they're busy taking care of lots of other if this gets below 92. Good. What about nerve function? I, I personally think uh, a resident should be evaluated for, for nerve function. Uh, yeah. So here's the things. This is what I say. So whatever you had before, you have to have the same. That's why that first note is really important, detailed. So if you told me, you know, that they can flex their thumb IP joint, I want them to still be able to flex their thumb IP joint. They couldn't do that. That's why it's good to know, because now I'm not worried. Oh, you had an AIM palsy beforehand. I'm not worried about that. You don't have the A's. You can move your fingers. Like, it is highly, like, kids are sometimes afraid. They are in pain. They can move their fingers. So putting in a note, someone can't move their fingers because it hurts, and you're going to send a kid home who can't move their fingers at all who had a supracondylar, that's trouble. And I have reviewed a few bad Volkman's ischemic contracture legal cases where that was the case. Kids sit home anxious, afraid, won't move fingers, we'll check in a week. That's a bad plan, okay? All right, so here we are three weeks later. So is this long enough, Matt? Can we take the pens out today? Yeah, I think, um, is it healed? Uh, yeah, I think it will. How do you know it's healed? You've got a uh, callus. Callus, what kind of callus? What is that? What tissue is that that's ossifying? It's, um, it's the most beautiful thing in orthopedics. Yes, yeah, Thick periosteum of a child's bone is like the most beautiful. Peeling periosteum is the best yeah. operation. <laughs> All right, so they have periosteal potential that adults don't have, so they're gonna heal super fast. I've never seen one that I didn't feel comfortable taking the pens out of three weeks, but some people wait for. How long is too long? To, when does the infection rate go up? Six is bad. You know, after six, I think most people take pens out at six because after six, uh, sort of an exponential rise, and that's why it's controversial whether or not we even give children with supraconylars antibiotics. Because if you have metal in that's percutaneously placed for less than three weeks, you to adequately power a study, the incidence of infection so low, you probably need like five thousand kids in each group, and that study is never going to get done. So, still dealer's choice. If you want to give antibiotics, give it. If you don't, don't. So it's healed. How are we going to take them out? <coughs> OR? No. no. So no berry pins. Take them in the clinic. I give them, we have cool little virtual reality goggles that they can distract them. And we did a prospective randomized study showing there's less anxiety and less pain. But I don't. Give them an iPhone. Give them something. Have them do something that distracts them. Distraction is a great tool in pediatrics. So um, some people argue whether or not you even need this x-ray. But I still take the x-ray like to see that it's healed. So then we're going to take the pins out, and I ask them to come back six weeks later, Olivia. Why do I wait six weeks? Yeah, what's important about the range of motion? What am I checking at six weeks? Full extension. Yeah, full extension. Why do you need full extension? So why? It's all these why questions. This guy keeps asking me why. What are you checking for? What do you want to know? You want to know that they have their motion back. Mm -hmm. So that's the, remember, we're trying to ma maintain length, alignment, rotation. Right? Mm -hmm. So how about the alignment piece? Yeah, the cubitus spares. So we want to make sure we didn't give them cubitus spares. We pinned them and they have a normal carrying angle, right? Compared to the opposite side, right? Can you tell me what's my carrying angle? Um, on the right side, probably 120. Yeah, 
about now? 100. Yeah, so if I go like this, so your elbow is a mitered hinge. The more you flex it, the more it looks like valgus. So even if they have lack 15 degrees of extension, they might be hiding varus that you left in there. So you really can't tell until they get full extension, right? And it takes about six weeks for most kids to get most of their motion back, maybe 80 or 90 percent. But there's one that had she had a bad one. So you can see she has an anterior scar. She had, a, uh, she had an open reduction, bad brachial sign. Those will often take longer to get their extension. They have worse injury in the front. Scarring in is thicker. I, I have no idea if her, she looks like she's more valgus on the left, but I don't know yet. So she's got to come back again. But if they come back, at, for me, six weeks after the pins are out, they have full extension. They can touch their fingers to their shoulder. Their alignment looks fine. Pulse is normal. Everything's working. I discharge. See you later. I don't know if that's what you do here or not. Is that what you do? Yeah. yeah. All right. So in the interest of time, I'm going to quickly just go and show you a couple. So I got an x-ray at six months on that perfused pulseless one. And the reason I did that is related to this. What's this, Joel? Avian of the trochlea. Avian of the trochlea, fishtail deformity, like rare. Um, it's one of those things that I'm not sure I know what to do about. If I see it, I'll often put a growth modulation screw on the capitellum so they don't grow further into varus because the tro trochlea is collapsed. They have a little bit of varus. So, but we reported we had 15% of those in our perfused pulses series. And I think there is a higher incidence. It makes sense. And if you have a perfusion problem to start with, you might have a perfusion problem later. So I either have them come back to six months to take an x-ray or I tell the parents, like, your elbow looks perfect now six weeks after the pins are out, if your elbow motion, because most of them, their elbow motion will get worse again, come back to see. So, last little thing, what, would you, what if you can't get it closed, Olivia? How do you open it? How do I open it? Yeah, we, we didn't get to our no varus, anterior humeral line hits the capitellum, we think there's a gap, whatever. We're gonna make an incision, we need to do it, because you all, they're all consented, closed versus open. How are you gonna open it? And this is purely for, like, bony reduction, not for any kind of arterial. Yeah, injury. yeah, yeah. Or it could be, because I think they'd be the same. Anterior. Anterior. So I do this. So make a little transverse incision at the level of the fracture, a little bit above. You can put your thumb in like that. It's really an open, closed reduction, because you can't like, look at the pieces. You're just trying to get the things that you're worried about, the artery, the nerve, and then periosteum, muscle, whatever, out of the fracture, so then you get the two pieces to go back together. And then you basically do a, a pin. So this, this child, when I was a resident, taught me that. So he has open fracture, came out almost transversely, a little obliquely. Most open ones will be like this, they rupture the skin anteriorly. And this kid, if you look back, we repaired his artery, he pinned it. But if you look at his scar, the only place that he has really a scar is where we, he, this is his wound, it's where we extended it longitudinally to get access to the artery. So if you're just doing it open and, you, and before you think like I need to go look at the artery, you can always extend it proximal and distal. So just start transversely and it'll be invisible. It makes a beautiful scar. You can see everything you need to see. Um, so for extension types, go anterior. Um, I'm gonna skip through this one to show you one more. This is what it looks like. So remember tendon, artery, nerve. So just make an incision, you can get wide exposure. You can see um, the artery, the nerve. Remember tendon, artery, nerve to, to figure out where it is. I use an intraoperative Doppler on those two. Um, this one just shows that there's low flow at the end. There's a pro potentially a little intimal injury, but then gets great perfusion just distal to it. So I think Doppler's helpful, pin. But one more, and she's normal in eight. So what's the difference in this one? This is the last case. We'll get you out of here. What type? Flexion, Flexion type. And what, what neurologic or vascular structures are at risk? Ulnar nerve. nerve. So if you're going to open this one, where do you go? Go medial, excellent. So go where the structures are that you want to protect. And this one, I tried to write a paper about this, similar to the paper here, but if you see bruising medially and you can feel the bone, my finger's on the bone, like those are ones that I don't try to do a closed reduction. And that's not really in the literature, it's just experience, but I tried to get it in there and it got rejected by numerous journals. <laughs> Reviewer number two killed me. All right, so make a medial approach, all right? So, uh, but the reason is this. So here's that same page. I can feel the bone, and then I make an incision, and there's the ulnar nerve. And I literally had to get a freer and peel it off of that spike. Um, so make it bigger so you can see it all. And then I use a lateral, instead of, I reverse, it's a flexion type, they're harder. Instead of the AP view, I usually do the lateral reduction first and then switch to AP. But penned, and you can put a medial pin in because you know where to put it safely now and make sure the nerve is safe and happy behind it. But if you see that medial brachialis sign, a medial ecchymosis sign, rather not brachialis, is not over there, medial ecchymosis sign, worry, especially if you can feel the bone on those because the nerve is probably draped over that. I've seen that three times now. So 
All right, so what do we talk about? Um, why depend on what the indications are for urgent surgery, what's a brachialis sign, how to do a milky maneuver, how to reduce it when it's displaced, criteria for acceptable close reduction, how to make incision for extension and flexion types if you don't get it reduced, what's an ideal pin construct look like, a little bit about Doppler. Um, so thanks for your attention. Happy to answer any questions. You guys know a lot. That was great. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, so recently out of where we both trained at Ray, they published a paper on closed reduction of high suit and supercondylar capacity. Yes. Because in the ER, hyperflexes the elbow mm -hmm. and extends it to 80 degrees and yeah. puts a cast on it. They valve them and then you do it yeah. a little way. Um, what's your thoughts on that? We do that. So I think it... Um, depends, uh, it favors that more in younger patients. But again, if they, so ketamine for our place, flex it all the way, then take it to 90, a, a posterior mole. There's no varus, so you have to make sure the coronal plane alignment is normal. Um, and then if you get uh, the anterior, same criteria though, the anterior mineral line touches the capitellum, I will take that. And uh, so we, we have switched to trying to do that, which is against the current guidelines in the academy do you guys use that? There's an ortho guidelines app. Do you guys know about that? You can see every CPG that the Academy has on their phone. So it's kind of helpful. But they say, the Academy CPG says, all type 2s should be penned. And uh, some people do that because they say they sleep better and they don't worry that it's... But we do that and then get an x-ray within a week. And if it falls off, then take them to the OR and pen it. And I think there's a UCLA study that's pretty large. They have, they're kind of like you guys. They see a lot of pediatric fractures. And they did it because they just didn't have OR time to pin all these elbows. And so, uh, and I think they, somewhere around 70% don't maintain that alignment, you know, obtain, maintain alignment until it heals. Good. Any other questions? Yeah, Alan. So if you had made any headway with uh, ERs, you know, the first case that you showed, um, we've told outside ERs before, yeah. it's pulseless, don't, don't delay, just send yeah. it to us, please. And yeah. But the catechism in the ER uh, is that if it, you have a pulseless extremity that displaced or dislocated, you know, bony injury, that you need to attempt reduction. Yeah. And so despite our best... You know, yeah, the, what I usually tell them is you shouldn't reduce it. If you do reduce it, you might be liable if there's a bad outcome. Because, And I'll tell them, I've seen lawsuits against ER doctors for trying to reduce superconic humerus fractures. I said the number one thing you can do is get this kid out of your hospital as soon as possible in a splint at 30 degrees flexion and send them to us. And I said, because I say, if you manipulate, you might do harm, and if the kid ends up having a bad outcome, they might put it on you. That will usually get them to push them your way. Yes, John. Okay, can you speak a little more about what's known in that zone by using pulse oximetry? Yeah, I, there, you know, um, I've been looking, at least in this zone, so we, we for a while, were using, uh, we, did a, we did some studies on, um, near infrared spectroscopy of the muscle compartment, like they do for cerebral perfusion in kids. And so we would put those under the cast. And we actually found that in a typical situation, the, that will actually register a higher level of perfusion than the opposite side. So it gets to be a little bit tricky to figure out. But if you see, if you're monitoring and it's continuous, you see it's decreasing. And certainly if it's lower than the normal side, that was a trigger for us. But they're expensive and you have to put them under the cast and it has a whole, but we would put them on the, actually the volar compartment of the forearm. And so for the finger, I just think it's another monitor. I, I don't know what the, the threshold is at your thumb for viability of your forearm muscles, which is what we're worried about. But it's just telling me something. There is some flow down there. It is being perfused with something. And I think it also just tells the nursing staff, like, wow, they're really worried about. Most kids don't come out of the OR with this thing on their thumb and telling me to go check a Doppler. And I think there's a heightened level of awareness that something bad might happen. I don't know the number, though. Right, if anybody does, please help me. So, Other questions? All right, thanks a lot.